Our speaker this morning is Reverend Ann Shand. Reverend Ann Shand is wonderfully gentle, serene, and just a beautiful person. Reverend Ann Shand. Good morning, everyone. Let me add my own words of welcome to our congregants, guests, and little Isabel, and our audience family in the world wide web. Our insights this morning starts off with a Bible verse, John 10, verse 10. I am come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly, end of quote. Our textbook written by Dr. Ernest Holmes, The Science of Mind, states on page 471, and I quote, today is good. Tomorrow will be even better. And that vista of tomorrows that stretches down the bright eternities of an endless future will all be good. For the nature of reality cannot change, end of quote. At the beginning of a new year, symbolically we set intentions to participate in a great experience by the setting of goals, projects, visions, missions. But the underlying foundation is that with the beginning of a new event or the setting of a new paradigm shift for ourselves, it is because we want a higher degree of satisfaction or fulfillment. Reverend Riker states in her article in the Science of Mind magazine of this month, and I quote, we are called to a higher level of being, service, action, compassion, and a change in our old patterning, end of quote. All that is necessary to embrace a life more abundant. So I've titled my insights this morning, Making the Adjustment for a Life More Abundant. Each new paradigm shift gives us the opportunity to test, utilize universal principles or spiritual practices to ensure a greater degree of livingness. A process by which we employ our gifts of insights, abilities, talents into actions that calls for versatility, innovation, creativity, change, and to transform our old ways of being into a new model of perfection, wholeness, and beauty, a life more abundant. We are called to step back and see rightly our new life when the seeming appearances of less than constantly bombard us. But let us take a stand that today, we are part of a world that works for everyone. We stand for truth, love, harmony, tolerance, acceptance, we shine our lights wherever we find ourselves and allow our brilliantly awesome selves to come up with innovative solutions, self-expressions of beauty and joy, and that we are truly free because we are individualized beings of God. So how do we step into our glory, make the adjustments, the tweaking of what does not serve us into something radiant with all the attributes of God? and a new phrase that came from our new class, Five Gifts for an Abundant Life. How do we savor each moment with a passion for possibilities? Our master teacher, Jesus the Way Shore, tells us in a very short parable taken from Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. And I read, another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened." End of quote. This parable was told after the parables of the sower and the wheat and tares. Metaphysically, the parable of the sower reminds us that the kingdom of heaven is likened to that of seeds of truth, which has unexpressed capacities and the necessity to plant them, these seeds of truth, in a mental soil best suited for growth. A fertile mind, a receptive mind that allows the seeds of truth to come forth in great harvests reflecting the fruits of spirit, love, joy, peace, 
patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Thus the kingdom of heaven, a life more abundant, is attained by first establishing in mind the consciousness of the truth of our being, and secondly, permitting the adjustment of one's outer world of experience by thoughts, actions, in complete harmony with the seed ideas of truth. Jesus Awashua also spoke of the parable of the wheat and tares, where good seed thoughts are mixed with error thoughts until the day of harvest, when the light of truth so fill our consciousness that we are able to weed out the error thoughts with wisdom by the use of spiritual practices. With that introduction towards the understanding of maintaining the fertile soil of our minds, the parable of the leaven was given. Irving Seal in his book, Learn to Live, suggests that it is not enough to plant or establish seeds of truth in mind, or even be preoccupied with the increase of ideas through whatever means to enhance our intellect with increased knowledge, to manipulate external conditions, or we may experience inertia, an unwillingness to let go of negative limited beliefs, preoccupation with form, but to utilize these seeds of truth to increase our sense of life and happiness, which stems from a deepening of our consciousness of the truths of life which set free. We know that we are individualizations of the one source of power, life, love, and wisdom. Therefore, we must understand that the transformation of the external world comes first from within, where the kingdom of God is. And also, the focus is on the faithful application of principle to be better instruments, conduits for the flow of a life more abundant, rather than the preoccupation with demonstrations on the external realm of form. Seal goes on to say, and I quote, but after time we must do more than merely increase the number of seeds. We must take them and crush them into flour, mix the flour with leavening, which will cause it to rise and to expand. And then finally, though the parable does not specifically carry, carry this far in thought, we must eat the product and further transform the seed into the life of man, flesh, blood, brain, thought, and feeling." End of quote. Metaphysically, I will break down the components of this parable to ensure our understanding of the concepts that lie therein and their significance to one's life experience. I'm using the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary by Charles Fillmore. The kingdom of heaven is the orderly adjustment of divine ideas in man's body and mind and ultimately spirit. So therefore, in order to understand that it is possible to live a life more abundant, we must become conscious of this divine mind of God, our mind and its realm of ideas, and be willing to adjust our thoughts, words, and actions to that of a divine standard. This is not confined only to individual consciousness, but is everywhere present. Wherever we find ourselves, we are always in harmony in relation to this divine standard because our true thoughts are able to flow into the realm of manifestation, into creating our heaven while having this earthly experience. Leaven is likened to a yeast of faith, the permeation of consciousness with seeds of truth, hope, trust, and love. This yeast is that divine impulsion that is within each one of us, that cannot change no matter the mistakes we have thought up, spoken, or acted out. This divine impulsion is from our soul. Very simply put, as spoken by Warren Chen Shui, the soul is the dwelling place of spirit. Which Emerson concurs, and he says, within man is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one, end of quote. The woman in the story, the parable, represents our feeling nature, the flexible side of us, the nurturer which provides 
the facility of the silence within us during the time of incubation of an idea. It is the giving sensitive side that may expand freely. This combination of the feminine and masculine within us culminates into the wholeness of being. Remembering that the masculine in each one of us is thought, the intellectualizing reasoning faculty that deals with ideas and perceptions. Note the leaven was hid in three measures of meal, crushed seeds into flour. This flour is used to make loaves, which stands for substance. Three indicates wholeness of life or the threefold nature of being, spirit, mind, and body. And as we are taught in the creative process in the individual, idea, creative medium, effect, thought, word, action, conscious mind, subconscious mind through law, manifestation. And last week's lesson with Reverend John, the partners in a relationship and the relationship itself. The threefold nature of being is reflected throughout the universe. To eat the bread means mental appropriation of ideas, embodying them, living from that foundation. An idea is like spiritual food. Eh? Man's food is substance. And we know man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Man partakes of the word of God by affirmation and so eats of the sustaining substance of spirit. Now, in the making of bread, there is the addition of sugar and salt and oil and water. Oil here means the oil of life, illumination. Water is spiritual inspiration, the truth. Sugar and salt are flavors which work together, as well as salt is a preservative and it relates to memory. Note they would have used honey in those days as a sweet, and the metaphysical meaning for bees, fine sense of discrimination and great activity, an active sustaining soul quality. If you remember from the parable, she hid in the measures of meal, the leaven. The verb hid means away from sight, go within. Deep in the inner, inner sanctuary of our being, we inculcate these ideas of truth until they manifest in our body and mind. But the combination of all the components incubated within allows the bread of life to become visible in our lives. Note also that even the memories of old patterns of thought that no longer serve us gets purified by the spirit and illumination. Note of caution. If we allow the presence of God, the illumined thought of God, to guide us by spiritual practices, we know how to utilize all the components of life into one wholesome life more abundant. Joy, peace, love, light, power, beauty, life, all the attributes of spirit. But if, however, by the accumulation of ideas we have garnered and we have chosen to manipulate the components, then we may obtain something different. For instance, when we have combined all the ingredients that allow the yeast or leaven to come alive and it is added to flour, substance, it is usually placed under a, deep cloth, a damp cloth sorry, to prove the activity of the yeast. The first proof of activity metaphysically heralds to us that we are on the right track. We speak our word and manifestation is almost instantaneous. The parking spaces are there or a quick demonstration of a desired goal. This is not the time to be sidetracked or derailed from your conscious, diligent, spiritual work. To shout from the house top, it works. It is a signal to keep the high watch, meditate, go within, giving thanks, and with even more resolve to stay the course. We cannot overemphasize that we keep silent and do the necessary spiritual work while waiting patiently for these ideas of truth to be properly incubated and embodied in that bread of life, which is waiting to be assimilated totally in our mind, body, and spirit. Opening the oven too soon 
or too late is the same result, derailment. Sometimes we experience an unwillingness to step up our spiritual practices because everything right now is our idea of great. But rather doing the work consistently and allowing our indwelling Lord to manifest through us vistas of tomorrows that stretches down the bright eternities of an endless future that will all be good. John 14, verse 12 reminds us, Jesus the way sure, he said, Verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do. End of quote. Note also that bread, if the flour is increased and the other components are not adjusted properly, or more raising agent is added than what is the usual amount, the bread comes out heavy with unfermented, unfermented yeast. All those who bake know what I'm talking, right? In the first instance, which means its metaphysical emphasis is on form, planting ideas for the sake of planting and not for conscious, diligent work of expansion of consciousness. Or in the second instance, when the bread is as light as a feather and you have more air spaces than anything. The metaphysical meaning in this case is that it is spiritual work for the public show, much like the Pharisees who are exact in performing every little detail of religious acts but lack love and mercy, limited in their thinking as they rely only on their knowledge of truth rather than going within to enable the mind of God to operate through the individual mind. When our mind is now raised up through the affirmation of God's omnipresent substance and life, we are not only fed, but there is a surplus for all the world to share. That delicious aroma of freshly baked bread, that is the aroma of spirit radiating through us, as us blessing the entire cosmos. I bet you look at bread now with respect. <laughs> This magical transformation of ideas into form takes place within us. We may not know all the details of how, whether through science or medicine, but the omniscience of God knows how seemingly ill health turns into radiant perfection, seeming lack into opulent wealth, the experience of loving relationships after loneliness and bitterness the joy of spiritual growth and unfoldment, brilliant self-expression in the world of art, music, business, and ex education. But the evidence is there for us to see among ourselves of persons of humble origins through ideas who take their place as change agents in today's world. One thing is for sure, there is no lack of inspiration around us. For us to diligently allow our lives to be models of making a difference wherever we find ourselves. The universe just wants us to live, as Henry Thoreau puts it, live with the license of a higher order of beings. Once the idea is planted, the law of mind consistently works to fulfill. This process, however, is modified from individual to individual based on their consciousness, which is determined by beliefs and moods. But we can delay manifestation, but the truth of our being, which is the reality that created us out of itself, never changes. So once an idea is introduced into our mental field through a spiritual practice, and we consider it positively and confidently, we bring warmth and feeling and life to the idea by the use of our imagination, enthusiasm, and inspiration, which are internal processes. We are guided, compelled, and directed to take certain actions. It is this enthusiasm and inspiration that makes the difference along with the will to act. It is this adjustment through listening and sensing what is happening to us internally that moves us from dreamers to doers. We can claim this life abundant as it is already an accomplished idea within our consciousness, 
or else we would not have been the pure and perfect conduits for its manifestation. It is law governed, which means it is predictable and consistent. And note again the number three, as used in the parable, the movement from thought impregnated with feeling, which leads to action. Thought is a part of our focused masculine side and the feeling from our feminine side, which I said before. Our feeling nature handles these seeds of truth, giving them rising, expanding qualities, and then transforms them into form and function. The enthusiasm, and, is, the enthusiasm and inspiration are products of the Spirit of God within us. And with this spiritual power at the foundation of our transformation, it is with certainty that we can give thanks because nothing can stop the manifestation, accomplishment, or mental assimilation of these truths into the embodiment of our being. So our adjustment is daily use of our spiritual practices. To see rightly our new world of experiences from the tangibles of form to the intangibles of spiritual growth, unfoldment, and elimination by ensuring that our minds are fertile, open, receptive, perfect conduits for the honor and glory of God. We can live from a higher level of consciousness that allows the entire cosmos to evolve at a higher level. We can enjoy the journey as already all has been provided for us. Let us pay attention to our internal and external dialogue. And as Larson reminds us, think on things that are of virtue and worth. Aspire to become more of who we are. Let us recognize the good in ourselves and all of ourselves. Let us wish for the things that give freedom and truth. Let us expect things that add to the welfare of all sentient beings. Let us speak only of that which gives encouragement, inspiration, and joy. And in our thoughts, words, and actions, let the ruling desire be always to ennoble, enrich, and beautify the existence of all who come our way. Finally, I leave you with this from James Allen. Dream lofty dreams, and as you dream, you shall become. Your vision is the promise of what you shall one day be. Your idea is the prophecy of what you shall at last unveil. End of quote. Namaste.